Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Computer History Museum. Thanks. It's great to have all of you here tonight. I'm John Holler, the President and CEO, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here tonight on behalf of our trustees and our staff, our members, and our amazing volunteers. Welcome again to another night of Revolutionaries, which is our speaker series, which uh, goes on and on and attracts more and more wonderful people, it seems, every month. And we're delighted to uh, have you here tonight to be part of that. Major funding for revolutionaries is provided by Intel. This is Intel's fifth year to provide funding for the series. We're so happy about that. That's right. Give them a big woo. I like the woo. It certainly makes all this possible, and we're grateful to Intel. We're delighted to have Justin Ratner with us tonight as we continue our revolutionary series highlighting innovation at research labs in Silicon Valley and beyond. Some of the labs we've already profiled include DARPA, SRI, IBM, Microsoft Research, and now the quite productive and vast operation at Intel. Justin joined Intel 40 years ago this year and was its first principal engineer. When you see him tonight, you'll know he's far too young to have done anything that long, but it's true. Uh, it didn't take long in his remarkable career for him to demonstrate both an aptitude and a strong interest in research, and for many decades he has led breakthrough after breakthrough in cutting-edge computing. Like a great doctor who may know a lot about a lot of things in medicine and also have one major specialty, Justin's area of strongest interest has been high-performance computing. But his work ranges across a wide spectrum of technology. We'll explore that with him tonight. And the sum total of that work has earned him a distinction within Intel reserved for only a rare few, the title of Intel Senior Fellow. Justin has also devoted more than 20 years to the problem of how to help the brilliant scientist, Dr. Stephen Hawking, communicate with the world and vice versa. This has proven to be a formidable challenge and we'll learn more about Justin's work with Dr. Hawking this evening. So please join me in welcoming Justin Ratner. Does it seem like it's been a long time that you've been doing what you've been doing, or has this gone by in the blink of an eye? You know, it's it's blink of an eye. Yeah, I mean, and it's it's hard to believe that you know, uh, you know, 40 years ago, I was uh, you know I was sitting down with uh, with Shima San, uh, trying to get the flag settings for the uh, for the 8080, which is which was about to launch. I guess about a month and a half after I got to Intel. It seems like only yesterday. What was it, when you look back at the very, very beginning, what was it that caused that voice inside of you to say, you know, this, this part of technology is in, of interest to me. I want to be an engineer. I want to pursue something in, you know, in pretty early days, um, certainly when nothing was like it is today. Well, um I know I drove my parents crazy, yeah, because um, you know they would give me some new toy. Probably my favorite example is you know I got a little, you know, locomotive, and within a matter of a few weeks I had deconstructed it. I think is the operative term these days, right? You know who else did that? Charles Babbage. Well, there you go. Babbage was famous for deconstructing his I'm toys. in good company then. So, <laughs> you know, I had this habit of taking things apart and on rare occasions actually reassembling them. But, um, you know, I, I was always interested in, in how things work. And, um, and you know, and that, that led me into being uh, an avid electronics hobbyist. Today I would be called a maker. We didn't know what makers were in those days and, you know, uh, you know, used to build kits of all of all kinds, and and um, eventually built. Um, I think I was about twelve. Built a, a simple uh, digital uh, device with a few flip flops, and took it to um, junior high school science fair, uh, and had all the um, all the teachers wondering if my dad had built this thing mm. for me, and my dad. They actually called him at work, and he said, no, he says, I just write the checks. I have no idea what he's doing. <laughs> you know, it's, that's all him. So Was uh, he technical? No, he was not technical at all, and, uh, and that's why they found it so hard to believe, and they literally cross-examined me. I mean, do you have an uncle, you know, a relative? Uh, do you know somebody yeah. in the electronics industry? No, I'm just, you know, I just 
like doing this stuff. It just spoke to you. Yeah. So, um, you know, so then, I mean, in, you know, junior high and high, you know, finally getting to take science classes and, and having the opportunity to uh, get a more formal grounding in all of this. What about a mentor or a teacher or professor somewhere along the way that really said, you know, Justin, you've got a real talent for this? Uh, well, I'll tell you, <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story. I'm, I, I went to Hollywood High School. Don't take that the wrong way. I went to Hollywood High School. <clears throat> Um, and, um, and one day I'm walking in to the library and there's this big oil painting as you come in in the foyer of the library. And I go, Who's, you know, who is that? I'm expecting it's some Hollywood director or, you know, something like that. And I, you know, peer down at the bottom and it says William Shockley. And I go, Shockley, Shockley, the transistor guy. So, uh, I... Later in the day, I'm in physics class, and I asked Mr. Burley, who's my physics instructor, I said, by the way, did, did you have William Shockley as you know, a physics student in high school? Absolutely. And I said, and I said how was he as a student? He goes, yeah, he was sort of average. <laughs> and I'm going, wow, you know, I would, if I was, if I was his teacher, I would take all credit for the Nobel Prize. Well, of course, he learned it all. He yeah, learned it yeah. all from me. But um, uh, no, I think if 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 you want to think about it early, but not a mentor, but I think somebody inspired me. Um, I, I was taking a, a summer science class, uh, you know, and uh, through the LA. Um, city school district, and we went out to Hughes Research Lab. Uh, if you've ever seen it or been there, you know it's just it's just incredible, up on the cliffs overlooking Malibu. And um, and one of our hosts was Ted Maimon, and they had just gotten the Ruby laser working, oh. and you know we were just you know oh my god, and you know they had it all nicely packaged and everything, and they showed us where they were, you know, pulling the crystal and all of the stuff to make, you know, to make the rubies and, and all of that. So that was a tremendous mm. source of inspiration. I mean, I, that was the one and only time I met, I met Ted Maimon. But um, uh, literally when I, when I applied for college, um, uh, I uh, applied in applied physics. Uh, but that's when the story takes a decided turn. Mm. So... Um, you know, when, uh, um, I, when I, I, in L.A., you can graduate uh, either in the winter or in the summer. And so I was a winter graduate. I had nothing to do until the fall to go to college. And um, a buddy of mine who was at MIT, but, you know, from the L.A. area said, oh, they're hiring at Scientific Data Systems. Uh, and, you know, think about connections. This is Max Polevsky's sure. company, uh, who later becomes a major investor <coughs> in, uh, in Intel. And so I went to work out there. Uh, you know, I passed this little transistor theory test, and you know, you're hired. And I'm working in board test, and um, uh, and they have an automated tester, just one on the whole floor. And you know, none of the techs wanted to touch this thing. And you know, I got some instruction, took home the manual. You know, and I'm cranking out boards at 10x what you know the rest of the techs. So they were ready to get rid of me because I was, you know, I was shifting the curve. <laughs> so um, so I got moved out to system test and you know and here I am, you know, I've got two or three of these SDS 930s just sitting, you know, on the floor and I had taken a programming class. So for the rest of the summer, you know, I just, you know, I just brought these machines up and ran them through all their diagnostics and had the freedom to program them you know, any way I want. Needless to say, when I got to college, to Cornell, I said, okay, I'm not doing applied physics anymore. <laughs> I yeah. said, I want to do computing. And, you know, switched into uh, electrical engineering. And the rest, as they say, is history. Yeah, fantastic. By the way, are you, are you one of those uh, California guys who went to Cornell and, you know, thought in the months of September and October, this is pretty nice out here. And then about February and March, you thought, I'm ready to go back to California. Oh, you've been to Ithaca. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. The, the fall is really a lovely time. Yeah. And, uh, and in fact, I, I'm on the, the engineering college um, advisory board. And, and, you know, we always have the meeting in October when the colors are at their peak. Uh, yeah, I had, you know, uh, I usually describe it as uh, frozen door lock syndrome. About the 10th time my, the locks froze on my car, I said, I'm going back to California as soon yeah. as I'm done here. 
So you joined Intel in 1973 after some time with HP and Xerox. Mm -hmm. um, what was it like at that point, and what took you there? Um, yeah, well, the interesting thing about how I got there, um, I, was, I was working at HP in the mini computer uh, division, um, you know, off of uh, Wolf Road down there in, in Cupertino. And um, a buddy of mine from HP uh, was a compiler guy, had already, um, already gone to work uh, for, uh, for Intel. And he said, hey, you know, you ought to come over and interview. It's, you know, pretty neat. They're doing some, some interesting things. But um, one day I just happened to be walking by one of the mechanical engineer's desks, and he, and he was working on a, you know, on a VT100 class terminal. And I started talking to him about it. And, um, and he showed me the motherboard. And he's saying, you know, he says, he, says, he says, this is the Intel microprocessor. Pretty sure it was an 8008, and which was sort of built for doing, you know, those, those old terminals. And I said, and I said, well, I said, well, what do you think about that? Because at the time, you know, we were doing everything with, you know, TTL, whatever. And he goes, that's the future. That processor. That, you just pointed at the 8008 and said, that's the future. And I said, when the mechanical engineer is pointing at a chip and telling you that's the future, that's something to really pay attention to. Now, this was my own private theory for many, many years. But at a, at a supercomputer meeting in uh, Kissimmee, Florida, Seymour Cray is giving a keynote presentation and, and relates the story of the only engineer he took with him from control data to Cray Research was his mechanical engineer. So Cray and I share that <laughs> appreciation for mechanical engineers. So uh, yeah, it was just that remark. And uh, you know, I called my buddy at, uh, at Intel and you know, got, uh, you know, got an interview set up and you know, got to interview with Ted Hoff and Stan Mazur and, you know, and the, the whole crew uh, at Intel at the time. And that was clearly the important uh, opportunity. Still a small company at that point. Oh, it was still a very small, very small company. I mean, you know, Bob and Gordon, you know, were just upstairs and shared an office. And yeah, yeah. Was it clear? I should have asked for more stock in that initial offer, <laughs> as, it, as, I, as I think of it. I actually asked my dad, you know, uh, what he thought about the offer, and he said, oh, he says, you know, go in and ask for more money. I could have gotten a lot more stock than money, I think, if I had asked for stock. So what were their immediate needs? What were the, what were the things a young engineer, very bright like you, were, was most needed to well, do? Well, there, there just weren't very many computer people at the time. Um, you know, Bill Davidow had just taken over the microprocessor group, whatever it was, I can't remember exactly what it was, what it was called at the, at the time. Um, and I mean, it was we were we were really starving for computer savvy people. I mean, most everybody was you know semiconductor technologists in some manner or fashion, and so they were you know they were just starting to um, you know build um, a team that um, you know that that really had the computer experience. Like I said, you know, I sat there with with Shimasan, you know. Um, because I was basically trying to complete the 8080 instruction set definition so it could be published and, and, and delivered to customers. And nobody knew what the flag settings, you know, however, how each instruction set the flags. And, um, and they said, well, go ask, you know, go ask shima -san. So I, I go upstairs. And, um, and I knew I was in trouble because he, he reached into his, his, you know, print stand pulled out the schematic of the 8080, rolled it out on his desk and said, give me the op code, I'll give you the flag settings. And that's the way we went through the instruction set. So I'm not sure they were actually architected, if I can use that term. I think, you know, the flags got set basically the way the logic worked out. And sometimes people, you know, I would be in customer meetings and people would say, you know, why do you set the flags that way? Because they didn't always make complete sense. Was it the difference between understanding computing at a system level and then understanding it at, at a chip level? Is that sort yeah. of what was needed? Yeah, okay. and you know, and there were, uh, you know, and, and I, it, was, it was a very innovative environment. And I give a lot of credit um, to Terry Opendijk, who, who um, ran the software team, and to um, Gary Kildall, mm -hmm. uh, you know, who got Intel to do things, you know, like the PLM programming language and, um, 
you know, and there were lots of debates about, you know, whether or not to do an operating system and, you know, and how sophisticated it should be and all those kinds of things. So, um, you know, I think it was, I think it was really, I think it was really valuable that, um, that very early on they, uh, you know, the management team recognized the need to bring in, uh, bring in computing people. We weren't making any money in microprocessors. In fact, it was years, I think, before Intel made money in microprocessors. But um, you know what we what we lost in microprocessors, we made up in memory. So yeah. uh, it was it was a viable business. Now I've always heard it de described in the early days as being a very innovative environment. It's just what you said. What made it innovative as a as a culture and a place to work? Wow. Um, you know I I'll, you know I really can't I can't say enough about about Bob Noyce. Uh, you know I mean uh, you know, a force of nature. And uh, you know, I remember sitting in my office, and you know, those were the days of closed-door offices at Intel before we went to cubes. And you know, there's a knock on the door, and you know, Bob walks in, and, and, and there was another desk in the office, but there was nobody at the desk. Um, and Bob hops up on the desk, and we just you know chatted about things, uh, microprocessor things, for the you know the next hour, or, you know, so. And, uh, you know, it was just, uh, I mean, it was just thrilling to be able to, you know, share in that brilliance. I mean, he's just, you know, just uh, such an extraordinary individual and, and uh, you know, uh, a great loss. I mean, you know, he died too young. Um, but, you know, a true innovator, entrepreneur, all of that. Everything they say about Bob uh, is true and then some. And then what about Gordon in that mix? Gordon you know, Gordon, uh, you know, in my mind, I, I didn't see Gordon as much as I saw Bob, but, you know, Gordon, in, you know, in, the, in the few meetings I was in, uh, was the consummate technologist. And I, th I think one of the things that made Intel so great in those early days where it was, it, you know, it was easy to take a, a wrong turn um, was his ability to pick the technologies um, that um, that we're going to win uh, in the end, and I don't think uh, another company managed the twists and turns of you know of technology as well as Gordon hmm. did. You know, from P channel to N channel to CMOS. Um, you know, and, and he he just saw all those needs. I, you know, um, I remember um, Federico Fagin making the comment that you know. All of the CAD he needed, he could he could get from his HP 35, and you know, and Gordon, I think the number, um, you know, this is probably um, mid to late 70s. You know, Gordon just picked the number and said, "Hey, we're going to spend seven percent. I think that's the number uh, of total R&D on CAD, and you know, that's just sort of the, the the minimum." And Gordon was, you know, just able to see that. Um, you know, given Moore's law, these things were going to get too complicated to design on a pocket calculator. That you were going to need, you know, serious computing power to um, to do that work. And he, you know, uh, he, you know, carved out a section of the of the R and D budget and said, "That's for CAD." Was it Bob Noyce who encouraged you to turn to research really as a full time pursuit within Intel? Or maybe I should just say, how did that happen? I. I yeah, I don't know. Uh, you know, there, there, there were just so many, um, you know, there's so many things. I think when, you know, when we started to look at high performance computing in the, um, you know, in the early 80s, I mean, Bob was, um, you know, Bob was pretty, you know, pretty uh, excited about that. And, um, and, and I, you know, I think um, was important in terms of supporting it from a funding perspective. Uh, and gosh, it must have been one of the last times I saw him alive. Um, we were donating one of our first machines to one of the Oregon schools, and Bob flew in for that. And um, you know, so this Learjet pulls into the airport in Hillsboro in Oregon. I'd, I'd moved, moved to Oregon, so this is probably, um, I don't know, 85 or something like that. And, and they let me come out, you know, onto the tarmac. And I'm looking through the windshield of my car, 
and Bob's at the controls. He's in the left seat, you know. The next thing I know, Bob comes bounding down the stairs and just jumps in the car and, you know, off we, off we go to, to donate, that, donate that machine. So, uh, you know, he was, he was just so approachable, but, um, you know, just, uh, I mean, you couldn't spend five minutes with him without getting excited about whatever it was he was thinking about and whatever you were thinking about. Yeah. And so the, the path into research was sparked by what for you? Well, I think... Uh, and, and labs and experiments. Well, yeah, I think, I, you know, I, the... You know, the, the early supercomputers, um, certainly, you know, these early parallel machines, um, you know, were, were to some extent, uh, um, experimental machines. Uh, you know, we barely knew how to, you know, how to program them. And, uh, and you know, so, uh, uh, you know, there was this constant sense of discovery that, um, you know, that was going on, discovery on our own and discovery with our, you know, with our customers who were, you know, these were some of the leading research institutes, uh, institutions uh, here in the U.S. and, and elsewhere uh, around the world. So, um, you know, we were, we were in some sense sort of immersed in a research environment even though our principal mission was supplying tools to, um, to researchers. So. Um, when it was time for me to, um, you know, to move on, it just seemed like the natural thing would be to, you know, continue in that research vein. And I, I went on. I founded the the server lab um, at Intel, and that was just, you know, that was just sort of the first step in that yeah. in that whole scenario. What was the early grail in high performance computing that you found yourself chasing with the research agenda? <laughs> well. Yeah, at first we had to convince uh, people with money that this idea of lashing up a lot of microprocessors uh, was actually a, the path, not a path, the path to high performance computing. Um, you know, I remember going to uh, a conference, I think, I think it was in upstate New, upstate New York somewhere, Albany or, or Rochester or something, and, um, uh, and I think I was the only person who spoke about um, uh, what later became known as the attack of the killer micros. I think that was a few years later. <laughs> but I mean, what, what did that mean? Well, at the time, you know, everybody was you know buying these big machines from you know principally from Cray, but you know, Control Data had its machines, and and you know there were others out there, you know, ETA and and so forth, um, and so big vector, you know, custom hardware machines. Um, ruled the roost, and somebody coming in with a lowly microprocessor and saying, well, um, it's not very fast today, you know, you know, maybe 50 kiloflops, uh, but just give it, you know, a couple of turns of Moore's Law, and, you know, it'll be, you know, 500 kiloflops and then five megaflops and, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and, you know, there were not many takers in those days, um, but, um, uh, but I knew the I knew the tide had turned. I guess it's 1991, and we put the um, the big Delta machine, which you have in your collection. We, by we the do. Way. It's right downstairs. You even have the little monument we built. I've seen it. Um, you know, when we when we installed the Delta at Caltech, I think it it set the the um, the parallel lint pack you know benchmark record, uh, beat the Cray XMP if memory serves. And I don't think I don't think a microprocessor-based machine ever lost that um, you know that title uh, again after that. After that, yeah, there may have been somebody, maybe one of the Japanese machines snuck in there somewhere. But did you have to develop the applications to run on these machines in order to convince people? Oh, sure. you really were on the right path. Sure. So, what were the early things that you had to do to demonstrate that that was the case? Well. Uh, you know, we, you know, we had to tackle, um, you know, all manner of sort of the fundamental arithmetic. How do you turn these, you know, these algorithms, these serial algorithms into parallel algorithms? How do you, you know, how do you get them uh, scheduled? How do you get them communicating? I mean, it was, I mean, it just was, 
you know, everything and, and anything. I mean, there was, you know, there was not much, uh, how should I say, off the shelf knowledge available. So, uh, you know, we went out and we hired people like Cleve Moeller, you know, from, from MathWorks. MathWorks was a little company in those days. And um, even though Cleve founded it, you know, Cleve needed a job. <laughs> so, you know, Cleve went to, you know, went to work uh, for us and, and, uh, and put together, uh, I think, a you know, first-rate team of, um, of um, you know, computational scientists. Uh, I think we called them numerical analysts at the time, but computational scientists and algorithmic experts and, and so forth, and, and you know, began, uh, again, working very closely with our, with our customers, you know, teams like at, at Argonne National Labs and, and elsewhere to really build that early uh, base of know-how. Could you see at that time, if you just continued, if the R&D that you were pursuing continued along that path and Moore's Law continued to just inexorably move forward. Right. Could you see what was ultimately going oh, to yeah. happen? Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, there was, uh, you know, we typically had, um, you know, uh, between a five and a seven year view. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and, and we, you know, we could see what was on, you know, what was on the roadmap way beyond what we were able to discuss with, uh, with customers. And, um, you know, we just knew it was, you know, it was a matter of, of time. I mean, we just, you know, I mean, we could practically tell you the performance out three, four, or more generations. If customers were hard to convince in the beginning, which you said they were, what was the tipping point? When did it finally cross that well, point? Well, I think for, um, for your app. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, the, I mean, I, I think, I don't know if I could pick the, the date off, but, you know, it's probably, I would say it's probably in that you know in the in the early '90s when um, when the you know the big parallel machines just excuse me their peak performance is just leaving the um, the vector machines <clears throat> in the dust and um, and you know there were, I mean there were still incredibly heated arguments uh, you know I remember uh, actually we're, we're just a hop skipping a jump from. Uh, uh, you know, from NASA Ames, and you know, and you know, they were very proud of the you know the craze um, that they had, and you know, and I used to get lectured uh, about, yeah, there's all this parallel performance, but we can't get to it. Uh, you know, it's too hard to program, uh, and um, you know, another one of the criticisms was, um, yes, you can get an algorithm to run very efficiently. You can get, you know, you can get um, um, you know, very high degrees of concurrency, but the algorithm itself is not very efficient compared to things um, that we'd run on these vector machines that just would be horrifically efficient, inefficient on the, um, on the parallel machines. Mm. But, um, you know, there, that lure of, you know, you know what was then, uh, you know, 100 gigaflops and, and then by the mid-90s, you know, a teraflop uh, just you know, continued to attract more and more um, interest from the community. Has this always been the, the Everest of computing, if you will, this, this absolute pursuit of speed and, and calculations per second and so on? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And in fact, uh, um, uh, I can't recall who, who said it to me, but, but, you know, the line was very simple, fast enough never is. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, and I mean, I think it's, I think it's still, I think that's still, um, that's still true, uh, true today, um, that, uh, you know, there are problem classes out there, um, you know, beyond the, maybe the tens of petaflops we can do today, and, you know, that's where, that's why there's so much conversation going on about how do we get to um, exaflop machines and even beyond Mm -hmm. Beyond that, I think the, you know, the problem has has clearly changed from, uh, you know, how do you sort of how do you wire these these things together in some efficient form to, how do you power them, and uh, you know, I, a few years ago I was on a, a DOE panel, and you know, we were going around, everybody was giving a you know a brief presentation, and I said. Well, the three challenges for exascale computing are power, power, and power. 
you know, everything else is you know, sort of down, uh, you know, down the line a bit. Um, so power has become, you know, this, this huge challenge for these high performance machines. And, you know, I, you know, nobody in the industry wants to be supplying a nuclear reactor with every, you know, every one of these guys. So, um, uh, you know, I remember talking to Secretary Chu, uh, you know, a few years ago, and, um, uh, and, you know, we were talking about the 20 megawatt uh, target for, for exascale, and he's saying, well, I think it should be, you know, 10 megawatts, not 20 megawatts. And, you know, I'm going, you know, I don't, you know getting to 20 is going to, you know, is going to be an incredible challenge. And, you know, now here's the Secretary of Energy saying it really should be 10. And, you know, and uh, I, I, I couldn't sit here today. I don't know if anybody could sit here today and, and tell you how you get to even 20, um, but, you know, before the end of the decade. It's, it's an enormous challenge. Just in layman's terms, can you explain how much power 20 megawatts is? What would we, what would we be powering if we well, had 20 megawatts you know, of power? It's, it's probably a small city or yeah, something like that. That's, yeah. that's 20 megawatts is a lot of power. Uh, I don't, you know, part of this is, uh, and in fact, the you know the cloud data centers are already up against. They, you know, they can't they can't pull enough, you know. Uh, off the you know off the the local grid um, to put all the servers they'd like to put into into a single data center. So they're starting to cluster the data center and uh, the data centers and um, and and the high performance computing people face the the same problem. Same problem. They literally cannot bring enough power into a single facility to uh, power some of these machines. So you built a machine for or a system for the Department of Energy that uh, achieved teraflop right. performance, which is one trillion operations per second. For those of us who didn't memorize our, our, <laughs> our table of two to the X power, what is, what is an exa, uh, what is an exa flop? 10 to the 12th? Yeah. Okay. Oh, exa. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Uh, 10 to the 18th. 10 to the 18th. Yeah. Did I get that right? Okay. I'm not often asked to do math on stage. How far, so. how far away? <laughs> See, I have notes. I'm cheating. You're sitting there with nothing. <laughs> it's I, easy for I've you. I've got this all written down here. I'll I show gave them. my calculator You can away. cheat off my piece of paper <laughs> okay. here if you'd like. What, um, so what, what is the, what application will get cracked at the time that high-performance executing achieves that level of sophistication? You know, now that's a great question. And I think it, and, and, um, the the problem to date has um, in terms of getting the and I'm talking about the U.S. now getting the congressional funding uh, for Exascale, which has been very very spotty uh, to this point, uh, has been the lack of um, a strategically important problem. So um, you know with with TerraScale and to a degree with Petascale. Um, there were very compelling national security issues, and, and if you you know if you look back at those those programs, um, you know that that Vic Reese ran out of out of DOE, um, you know they um, they convinced the you know the Congress that this was the only way to successfully manage the nuclear stockpile. Um, when the test ban treaty went into effect, I mean, you couldn't you couldn't blow these things up anymore, even underground. So the only option was to blow them up, in you know, in the computer to simulate the explosions, and that's what you know initially took uh, teraflops of performance, and, and probably still today, um, you know, takes I don't know if it takes a full uh, petaflops machine to do it, but something in that mm. you know uh, certainly well north of a of a hundred teraflops. Um, and so, you know, so ignoring scientific advances, I think, you know, the, the, um, the politicians could say, well, we're, you know, we're doing this for, you know, for national security and science will benefit. But, you know, there'll be this, um, you know, this, uh, well, I don't want to call it trickle down, but, they'll, you know, those machines mm -hmm. will exist um, at, you know, at, uh, 
the, the big energy labs, and, and certainly the scientists will use them for many things besides managing the stockpile. Um, we haven't been able to, you know, we haven't really been able to crystallize the strategic, um, uh, the strategic requirement at Exascale. And, and, and I think it's, you know, I think it's unfortunate um, that uh, perhaps the Congress hasn't embraced this notion of fast enough never is. I mean, we, you know, I think they we haven't embraced that notion in almost anything. <laughs> as, far, as far as far as I can tell, yeah, I, yeah, I sort of walked into that one tonight. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, <laughs> that sort of slow enough is not slow enough, right? Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah. um, but you know, I, I, th there's no question. I mean, you know, virtually every scientific discipline in that DOE panel I mentioned. You know, we brought in all of the you know the scientists. You know chemists and physicists and you know, biologists and all this stuff, and, and they could all talk about uh, the kinds of problems that they would, they would solve um, with, that, with that much performance. And so I, I don't really think there's any argument um, that it's in our competitive, in our competitive interest as a nation to have that kind of computing capability. And, and um, you know, we're simply not going to be competitive um, if we, you know, if we let others around the world um, um, either have access to these machines or, or let them build these machines with their, with their own uh, technology. Um, I mean, if we could just say, hey, you know, as far as we can see, this is going to remain a, you know, a, a you know, an economic necessity. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, competitive necessity. If we just get everybody on that that page, then you know, I think we would, you know, we wouldn't have the struggle with you know every one of these these jumps in performance that we do. But we're we're clearly not there yet, and people uh, on the hill are still looking for. Well, give me the you know, give me the national defense, the strategic uh, argument why we need to build one of these things, mm -hmm. and it's getting it's just getting harder and harder to do that. There's, you know, there isn't something beyond stockpiled stewardship that we've seen to date, um, you know, that does that. And I had this conversation with with Vic Reese, uh, you know, over the last uh, year. He's still lurking the corridors at, uh, you know, at DOE, and uh, and you know, and he basically said, you know, here's my card. If you come up with that application, you know, call me as quickly as you can. So they're 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 still struggling with that. Mm. Let's leave high performance computing for for just a minute and talk okay. about Moore's Law, which we were talking about sure. earlier. So no conversation with an Intel senior fellow would be complete <laughs> yeah, right. without a discussion of Moore's Law. Right, so right, right. where do we stand now on Moore's Law and, and how it's going to play out? Okay, before I answer, okay. I, you, you, need to, you need to provide me with a little more definition as to what you think Moore's Law describes. And not, not the, you know, not the, you know, the typical explanation. Um, because if, you know, if Moore's law in some sense is independent of the, of the underlying technology, then, um, you know, then I think Moore's law is very likely to last for many decades into the future. If Moore's law pertains to a specific technology, we've actually seen those technologies ride on Moore's Law come to an end. Um, you know, for Intel, uh, you know, Moore's Law for Silicon Gate MOS technology, you know, ended, what, three generations back, right? Um, and, you know, a, um, a new set of materials, you know, high K metal gate, um, you know, had to you know, replace silicon gate because uh, the oxides were getting too thin and, you know, the leakage was dominating the, you know, the power equations. Um, but, you know, uh, there was plenty of opportunity for innovation and, um, you know, and, and a replacement um, material stack was, uh, you know, was developed and brought to market on the two-year cadence of Moore's Law. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't think, um, you know, the significance of that uh, was really brought to, mm. you know, wide attention that, hey, you know, 
some version of Moore's Law, some instance of Moore's Law did come to an end for Silicon Gate and, you know, and a new version of Moore's Law. By the way, the new version of Moore's Law didn't last very long either, you know, because I think it was two generations. We introduced the Trigate, the FinFET transistor, and now we've changed the material stack and we've changed the, the physical structure of the, of the device. And, um, you know, and I think we're in a period, uh, in fact, I was teasing one of the material guys at, at Intel a few years ago. I said, I said, boy, you guys have really come back into fashion. You know, I mean, just making, you know, better silicon or nitride or, you know, oxide, whatever it is. You know, that's what these guys did for their bread and butter. But now they're back to the periodic table going, oh, okay, you know, something from this column ought to work out, okay. Um, so as so, a matter of chemistry and material science, that's evolved. There's been an evolution oh, yeah. in Moore's yeah. Law. And, and, I, th and I, th I, I describe it as, you know, it's, it's a period of high flux. I mean, I don't, you know, I don't think, you know, Trigate, FinFET devices are, you know, are sort of, well, that's it, Yeah. right? I mean, there's stuff behind, you know, stuff behind that. And, you know, and, um, and we're even, <clears throat> you know, now actively looking, <clears throat> and this is another part of that Moore's Law question I, I, I pose to you, um, you know, we're looking at non-charge effect devices, right? Everything to date is, you know, is a charge effect device. And by the way, I mean, CMOS, um, and, you know, I mean, we've done the homework on, on this at Intel, and I'm sure, you know, others have as well. It's pretty, it, pretty damn good. You know, if you've got to push charge around, there's not much other stuff you can do that will move it as, uh, and, and store it and move it as efficiently as, as CMOS does it. Right, but now we're starting to look at things like spin, and you know, and and you know, spin torque transistors, and and um, and other devices that um, that deal with these these alternative quantum effects. And so, will we still call it Moore's law in 2020 or whenever? I'm, I'm not forecasting anything, but we still call it Moore's law in 2020 when the transistors don't even operate on the same, you know, mm. fundamental physics mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that they use, to, they use today. So, um, uh, but I tend to just, you know, I just tend to think um, that, I don't know if, I've even, if I'm even safe saying this, but, you know, I tend to believe that, um, that the, certainly the opportunity is there um, for, you know, for many new device classes, device architectures, and other quantum effects to give us something with the appearance of Moore's law, this law of accelerating returns, as Kurzweil puts it, mm -hmm. um, for, you know, for decades to come. I mean, people talk about, you know, graphene and, you know, and doing things with, you know, nanotube transistors, and there's the molecular transistor school. So I, you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm not in any Panic. In fact, Gordon Moore used to say, hey, we, you know, we can never see out more than 10 years. I think it's probably more than about eight years. You know, we can never see more than 10 years into the future with Moore's Law. And, you know, and those horizons have come and gone. And, you know, we're still, you know, we're still at it. So I, I, I guess you put me in the optimistic category if you, if you accept the relaxed definition yeah, of Moore's I, Law. Yeah, I understand. So just as a, as a, Moore's Law is a shorthand for as you said, accelerating returns, ever increasing computational power. Right, right. You're optimistic that that will continue even if the underlying material science yeah. has changed. Yeah, I think, yeah. I mean, these are gonna be very, you know, very different devices and they're gonna be likely to be manufactured in very different ways. I think uh, silicon will still play a key role, if you will, as a substrate for a lot of these, um, you know, for a lot of these uh, designs uh, or, or device architectures, uh, but um, yeah, but we'll you know we'll see lots of things. I mean, Intel published a paper uh, as you know has had a, as have a number of others, um, you know, putting um, you know three five transistors down on silicon uh, substrates. So for all you gallium arsenide fans, there may be uh, it's back. There may be a future. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, for um, for the three five materials with their very high mobilities, uh, um, you know, if uh, uh, if some of these other uh, device structures um, don't turn out, and 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 probably the place to look. I mean, if you want to keep your keep your 
eyes open for this. I think uh, you'll see it in, in memory devices. I think memory devices, uh, as they have in, some, in, a, in a very in a traditional way, always been the harbinger of you know, where the technology is going. And I think you could even buy um, uh, memories now you know, that, um, that claim to use, uh, claim to have spin torque. Uh, I can't independently verify that, but they say they are. Um, and, um, you know, and, you know, there's a global race on to figure out what's going to replace um, NAND flash, uh, and that's liable to be a, a novel material mm -hmm. um, uh, stack up and a novel device architecture. Is there a principle running alongside Moore's Law now or something that's coming to the forefront that may overtake it as just a principle of modern computing? Oh. Wow. Um, actually, I think there's probably more interest in um, expand or, or discovering laws of accelerating returns in technologies other than semiconductor technologies. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I know you had, um, you know, Paul Jacobs yes. um, here. And, and he, got, he got pretty close to it, but um, something we've been working on at Intel Labs for a long time is the completely digital radio. Um, and, uh, and, and what we mean by completely digital radio is one that you can build on a digital process and take full advantage of the scaling that is associated with Moore's Law. Um, you know, Analog radios or quasi-digital radios, if I can use that term, uh, don't scale, or have a very difficult time scaling. Or you know, it's 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 you know, it's a very it's a very flat curve relative to um, you know to Moore's law, and um, uh, you know, we used to joke that uh, um, that only Intel would be motivated to to build a pure digital radio because we have such a crappy analog <laughs> process. <laughs> so uh, uh, you know, I think I think the last serious analog process was probably at 90 nanometers. And there, if you know anybody from Intel, this is a very sensitive subject because um, we spent a lot of money to uh, to do that. And um, and so we in the labs, we just stopped working on. Um, you know, on, on sort of the traditional analog approach to radio. And, mm -hmm. and um, you know, and, and to come back to this law of accelerating returns, the, you know, digital radio returns to the fundamental mathematics of communication. And this is, this is the thing that when I, when I listened to your, your interview with Paul, I, you know, my ears kind of perked up because, um, you know, the, the underlying mathematical theory um, of radio and communications in general, you know, pretty much suggests, you know, well, you ought to do this computationally. I mean, here's a set of equations. That's the foundation for communications. Just compute it. Mm. And, and that's essentially the approach that we've, that we've taken. We've turned, you know, whether you're talking about reception or transmission, modulation, all these things, we focused on it as a computational problem. And you know, given these astonishing budgets we have, you know, for transistors, um, you know, we're able to build radios in our, you know, highest pitch or you know, finest geometry mm. uh, process. So, um, so that suddenly lifts communications onto a law of accelerating returns. Um, and what would be the impact of that if that's achieved? Well, you know, I think. You know, everybody, you know, believes you've got to bring the radios on board with the rest of the, the system on chip. Uh, you know, if it's a computational uh, problem, if you've turned it into a computational problem, well, it's just, you know, adding those processing elements to all the other processing elements. And, you know, there's all this concern about, oh, well, you'll probably couple all this noise through the substrate. You know, we... You know, we went through all of that, and you know, and today we can put you know processors right next to radios, and they don't, you know, they don't bother one another. You don't have, you know, frequency pulling or any of these other ill effects that that you find in radios. Um, you know, I think photography, um, you know, is is something else 
that you know, it's still very early on. I mean, you know, we all marvel with the cameras that we have in our, in our phones. Um, and trust me, the image processors in those phones are getting more and more powerful with every generation because they're doing less. And in phones, it's, it's almost impossible to do anything all that great with lenses. So, you know, you have to, you have to manipulate um, those, um, you know, those signals in the computational domain. You can't, you can't do it in the optical yeah, domain. Yeah. So that's another one, and, I think, and bio is sort of the last one on my list. I don't know if these two things are related to what you're talking about now, but I know you've been working on what's called video-aware wireless networks, which will also begin to optimize what really is not, or often is not, a great experience, which is right. video over wireless. Is that related to this whole computational progress you're talking about? Uh, yes, maybe not, maybe not so much as a, you know, as a law of accelerating returns. That's, that's really a case of, um, of most of the systems today sort of operate open loop and, and video aware wireless, wireless networks is, is really has its objective to close the loop to be able to, um, you know, to measure in, you know, in real time the quality of the image and then send information back up the channel so that at each you know, stage in the channel, you're, you're choosing the optimal setting. I mean, do I need more resolution? Do I need more frames? You know, what's the trade-off? Um, you know, there are lots of things you can do, but today, you know, a lot of stuff just gets shoved down the pipe and fingers crossed and you know, I hope it, we hope it looks good when it finally gets to your device, wherever that device is. Yeah. And, and, and closing the loop, I think um, you know has the potential of, of guaranteeing uh, a um, you know better uh, I was going to say a great user experience, but I'll say a better user experience than just running open loop and hoping for the best. Okay. I'm going to talk now a little bit about your relationship to Stephen Hawking and this search for a, an interface mm -hmm. that will allow him to be open to the world and us to be able to understand him. By the way, let me just pause for a minute and say question cards. If you have those, please fill those out. We'll be around to pick those up in just a second. Um, let's start, if we will, well, let me set the stage for the video clip that we're going to show okay. because Stephen contracted Lou Gehrig's disease at the age of 21 mm -hmm. and he's just celebrated his 70th birthday. 71st birthday. 71st birthday, yeah. which is absolutely amazing. Right. And you were part of the celebration of the birthday, and we're going to talk. We're going to show a little piece of video, and then we're going to talk about sure. your work with Stephen Hawking. Okay. Today marks a very special day in history, not only for Stephen Hawking, but also for many, many people and lives that he's touched throughout his time. Many people gathered at Cambridge University here today to celebrate the life and the work of Professor Stephen Hawking and the impact that he's made. Dear fellow friends of Professor Hawking, we're sure that you agree that Stephen has done more to promote the public understanding of cosmology than any other living individual. And we are glad to consider this remarkable man our friend. There is no more appropriate time to honor Stephen than today, his 70th birthday. It's really an honor uh, for me to, uh, to be here on, uh, on this very special uh, occasion and and we're just uh, you know just delighted uh, to be part of this uh, of this great celebration for Stephen uh, on the occasion of his 70th. Now that I have reached three score years and ten, I hope you will forgive me for looking back over my life and how our understanding of the state of the universe has changed. I was born on January 8th, 1942 exactly 300 years after the death of Galileo. However, I estimate that about 200,000 other babies were also born that day. We're going to be looking very carefully at applying some state-of-the-art uh, computing technology to improving uh, Stephen's communications speed. We hope uh, that this team has a breakthrough and actually identifies the technique and, and we can get Stephen uh, communicating back at, at the levels uh, he had um, a few years ago. That's fantastic. 
So talk a little bit about what the challenges are and, and what you're working on with him. Well, Stephen, um, Stephen got a hold of me, I guess it was October of, you know, of 2011, and um, uh, you know, just <laughs> sent me an email. <laughs> You know, you're sort of browsing through your emails, and all of a sudden, Stephen Hawking, you know, scrolls by, and you go, whoa, you know, <laughs> you know. And typically, you know, it's like, you know, it's somebody selling a book or something yeah. like that. This is really Stephen Hawking, you know. And uh, seemed to have the right credentials and all of that stuff. Um, <clears throat> and, he, um, and he invited me to, uh, you know, to come to Cambridge and, and have this conversation about uh, what we might do to um, bring his communications uh, performance back to the level you know it was if, you know a few years uh, a few years ago I mean you know he was doing uh, you know ten words per minute then it dropped to about seven words per minute you know and now uh, I haven't seen a recent number but my guess is it's sort of in the one or two words per minute and uh, you know I mean Stephen's not verbose but you know when you hear a lecture uh, like you like you heard in the clip um, and that takes a lot of time for him to, you know, to craft. Even just having a, a question and answer session with Stephen, as you know, you, you know, you ask the question and then, you know, you take a break and, you know, maybe 10 or 15 minutes later you get a few word uh, answer. I, I, I hope you could all see, it was, it was pretty sharp here on the down monitors, but um, his current interface is just this blink sensor, as we call it, that uh, is, you know, hung off his, uh, his eyeglasses. It, just, uh, it dangles down near his cheekbone. Yeah. It's a sensor. Yeah, because, and the reason it is because when he blinks that eye, uh, you know, you get a little, you know, you get a little signal and we amplify that signal and, you know, eventually what that does, um, his, you know, his classic interface is it stops a cursor and the cursor is traversing the screen where the letters of the alphabet you know, other symbols, numbers, what have you, and then uh, a small number of, you know, computer commands um, are, are located. And what Stephen does is wait for that cursor to get to the letter or symbol or command that he wants, and he blinks. And, um, and if he's got to make a correction, he has to, you know, he has to wait for delete to come by and choose delete, and then he's got to go back to the letter, and I mean, you just think about this for a while, and you, you realize mm. how tedious this is. Uh, that said, he's been remarkably successful using it, um, and, uh, you know, he's surprisingly good at it. I mean, we've had other people try to, you know, to do it, and it ain't easy, and, you know, they inevitably wind up either you know, blinking too soon or too late, but you know he's he, he can do it pretty, pretty reliably. So, um, so we said, you know, sure. Now, you know, Intel, I, I think since the, um, I think even I think going back in the late '80s, um, you know, at least as legend have it has it, um, Stephen bumped into Gordon Moore at some conference, and um, and. Um, and Gordon noticed that he was not using an Intel-based laptop. And Funny how and, he always notices Yes, those. and Gordon said to Stephen, he goes, Intel will take care of your computing requirements uh, for, you know, as long as, as you need them. And, um, and, you know, and immediately somebody from, uh, from the office outside London was upgrading, you know, his computer, and we've continued to upgrade. Uh, his computers, you know, every every few years. Um, we did not, however, upgrade the user interface. The interface. We, you know, we always we always took that as uh, as a given. And when he was productive with that interface, you know, it, you know, that was fine. But uh, it just got to the point where you know he realized it was you know um, uh, it was important uh, for him uh, to you know to to bring the speed back up. Um, we were not, by the way, we're not the first people to attempt to do this. I mean, people came in with eye trackers and, um, uh, and you know, EEG caps and all this stuff, all of which we were told uh, by Stephen and the, and the staff, you know, he rejected within 
you know, a matter of minutes. I mean, they said, if you last, this was going into the meeting, they said, if you last more than 20 minutes, you're doing really good. Uh. <laughs> <You know? laughs> because generally, Stephen doesn't have a lot of patience for, you know, for these things. <clears throat> but um, it was during that, that first conversation that I noticed he was communicating with members of his staff using facial gestures. And, you know, we started to, we started to talk about that um, as well. You know, if, if really those are distinct gestures, we can probably train a computer to recognize those and expand, you know, his, his symbol set beyond this, you know, this one blink, uh, which is, you know, pretty limited. I said, gee, if we could just distinguish between a dot and a dash, we'd have Morse code, and, you know, that would be a big in improvement over where we are. So it was at lunch when um, I think his, his personal assistant is Judith. Judith comes up to me in the lunch line and she goes, he's got a lot more expressions than the kids realize. Huh. You know, she's been his assistant for many, many years. And, you know, and I, mean, I mean, she just looks at him and you know, she knows what he, what he wants. And so I said, I said you know, okay, I believe that. And if that's true, we can teach a... We can teach a computer to recognize those, those, um, those expressions. Um, then, you know, we were ready to send, um, you know, one of our research teams in right away. Um, Stephen was ill. Actually, Stephen was ill at, yeah, at the 70th birthday. Uh, he did not attend um, in person, although he did give his lecture. Uh, <clears throat> so I think it was probably February of 2012 uh, or a bit later, the team, um, you know, finally got uh, to spend time with him, and he gave them hours and hours of time. Mm. Uh, and, and I think a lot of credit, you know, both to Stephen and, and to the team, um, it was framed as a research project. We're not here with an answer. I think that's, that's, that may have been why he rejected some of these other mm. technologies that people had, um, uh, had brought to him, because, you know, they had a solution, and they were trying to make it, make it fit, and we were looking for a solution, and, and we laid out a series of experiments, uh, you know, which he was a key member, and, and, you know, he gave us incredible amount of time, and, I mean, we, we captured, you know, that, um, uh, you, know, and, you know, stereographic, I mean, you know, multiple cameras and all kinds of stuff. Uh, and, then we, um, and then we set to work to redesign the, the user interface, um, which is, um, you know, which is um, oh, more than a decade, uh, decade old. Um, uh, we, we were not able to get source access to it, so one of the first things we did was to rebuild it um, uh, ourselves. So, you know, we had, we had a reference base that was equivalent to what, um, to what he had. Um, and then we started to, you know, we started to bring in newer technology. Um, they, you know, it didn't have a very... Um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, you know, it didn't have a very capable, um, you know, word suggestion theme. You know, mm. where you type a few characters and it, you know, it prompts you with the word. It was, you know, it was very limited and didn't and uh, had no learning capability. So, mm. you know, frequently used physics terms were not the ones that got, you know, black hole didn't pop up. You know, when you got a B and an L down there, right? So, um, you know, so that's what we've been doing. And he's been, um, he hasn't switched. To the to the new interface, I want to be very clear on that. Um, but he he uses it, he, and he also comes in via Skype using the interface to the the labs here in uh, in Santa Clara, and um, and you know and and run Skype um, you know using the using the new UI. So you know we're still um, you know we're still tuning and honing and optimizing, and we hope by the end of the year that. Uh, you know, we'll be ready, and he'll be ready, and we'll make the, the switch to the uh, to mm -hmm. the new interface. But um, uh, you know, anybody who's worked on the team will you know tell you he's just been a, a delight. Um, well, in fact, one of our, our key UI uh, designers um, is also wheelchair bound, and um, uh, and he went on one of these trips, and whatever van was taking him from from Heathrow up to Cambridge. Um, I guess the lift, well, he's a big guy, and so the, when the lift 
pulled into the van that knocked his you know, forehead, and he got this gash in his forehead. Oh. And so Stephen sees him, and he goes, Peter, you know, what happened? And, you know, Peter, you know, tells him the story. He says, he says you take my van back to Heathrow, uh. Uh, because my van has lots of, lots of clearance. So, um, so he's worked really well with, uh, with the team. Uh, we're always concerned about his health. You know, I mean, he has, you know, good days, good weeks, good months, and bad ones. And, um, you know, so we, you know, we have to work around that. But um, we have, you know, high hopes for a uh, uh, successful transition to the new UI. And if it succeeds, will it be a, a really significant change? For yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Really significant change. And, and you know, and, and I mean, we don't have the time to sort of talk about all the the features, but um, but the you know uh, the interface is um, is much more contextually aware. Maybe we'll talk about context here before time runs out. But yeah, um, you know the interface he had, uh, you know, like I said, you know, couldn't learn, um, you know, couldn't sort of optimize itself for for how he worked. Uh, the new one is designed to do to do just that. Uh, and to be, you know, more malleable. So, I mean, if he decides, you know, he wants a new function, it's very easy to, you know, incorporate, um, you know, additional, uh, additional functions. And, you know, all uh, with the goal of making um, him just that much more productive. This is a great segue into contextual computing. And let's talk about that for a minute before I get to the um, audience questions. Sure. Talk about that as... The next frontier in computing and the research that you're, you're, you've been doing and your team has been working on. Well, yeah, we've been, you know, we've been working on context for, you know, for a number of years now. I, I think, you know, my view has been for a long time that, um, you know, that's the next, um, uh, the, the next major uh, advance. Um, you know, when we when we look at at different applications. For, for context uh, awareness, they, you know, they, they lift almost everything uh, to a level where, um, you know, you think you're, you know, you're dealing with a conscious entity. I don't want to get, you know, I don't want to get too carried away with that, um, you know, but, um, uh, you know, if, I mean, when you bring context in, to uh, you know, to almost anything, you know, I mean, you begin to feel like, well, there, you know, there must be a sentient being here running around someplace, because suddenly, you know, dialogues of almost any kind um, have this very human feel to them. Uh, I remember uh, we were doing speech, re speech research at, at our Beijing lab, and. Um, and this was shortly after I took over microprocessor research. This is 2000, and I have this phone call, uh, and I'm talking to you know the research team there, and and the whole lab at that in those days was doing doing speech and natural language, and and I asked one very simple question. I said, "What's the relationship between recognition performance, recognition accuracy, and microprocessor performance?" There's this long silence, you know, to the point I'm going, you know, maybe we've lost the connection. <laughs> And finally, somebody says, well, there isn't one. And I said, well, if that's true, we're in big trouble. <laughs> and and I, it was a recognition, at least at the time, you know, and this is, you know, 13, 14 years ago, it was a recognition at the time that, uh, you know, the algorithmic know-how simply wasn't there to, um, to exploit um, the performance. You know, so just throwing more MIPS or flops at it wasn't, you know, wasn't going to improve uh, improve accuracy. So, uh, you know, when you when you when you start to bring context to bear, let's say, you know, in speech recognition, um, uh, as Victor Zhu described it, you know, you 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 go from things that feel stupid um, to things that you know begin to feel very familiar, and and I, they had this system at the time, I guess, uh, where you could you could uh, make a plane reservation, uh, and I, I I don't recall exactly how you got to this thing, but you could call up and, and make a plane reservation. Well, God forbid, you got halfway through the reservation and wanted to change like the time of departure, 
And you would say, you know, it would say, well, you know, it would prompt you to say, you know, I have departures from Boston to Washington at 8, 9, and 10. And you would go 10. And it would go, okay, you know, I booked you for a 10 o'clock departure. And then you'd say, no, I really want to go at 9. And then it would go, I did not understand, you know, that, <laughs> the, the previous utterance or something. And it would go, well, I want to take the earlier flight. Well, at that point, it's completely lost. And, you know, context, you know, gives you the ability to, you know, recognize that you're in a conversation about air travel and that, um, and that corrections are a natural, you know, a natural part of making a, making a booking. Um, and uh, as I said in, in my IDF keynote a few years ago on context, um, there are also platform implications of context and, and uh, and those are going to be very important because, because as you bring, begin to introduce context, now you need to literally be always aware of what's going on. I mean, you need to be processing sensor input on a continuous basis. Well, you know, that requires innovation at the platform level. I mean, why do you think you have to push the button on so many of the recognizers we have today to say something? It's because it's too expensive just to listen all the time. Yeah. Right? And uh, we've got to get beyond that, right? I mean, I don't push your button to, you know, <laughs> you know have you, um, you know, listen to me. Um, so, you know, um, you know, we've been working not, not only on these sort of higher level machine learning um, algorithms for, for bringing context to bear, but also on how do you change the platform mm -hmm. so that it, it, it has the appearance uh, of doing uh, continuous sensing in you know in multiple modalities, um, and you know and again it seems to exhibit human-like behavior. You know, before we get to the audience questions, I just want to take that last answer that you gave as an example of something that really fascinates me with with your labs and with every lab we've explored, which is that there seems to be no boundary. You know, you've talked about things that. I'll bet if people in this audience who are listening or people on the radio who are listening thought about Intel as a company, many of the things that you're talking about are not necessarily something we would associate with Intel the way we know it. And that's true of many labs. What, what has it been about the culture that you've built and you've experienced that has created this sense of freedom that we're just going to wander through the world and we're going to encounter all these human <laughs> problems and we're going to pick some interesting ones and really go deep? I think we I think we've understood for for a long time at at Intel that um, you know that uh, our future isn't solely dependent on the next better transistor and and as soon as you sort of realize that um, that the you know the products you know of tomorrow are going to depend on a range of technologies that that go way beyond just what that you know that transistor um, is you know is is doing or is going to do in the in the future. Uh, you almost can't. I, you know where do you stop, right? Uh, you know why do you know why do we have a team of you know social scientists, anthropologists, you know at Intel and Intel Labs? Well, um, you know understanding how people experience technology informs you know, much of what you're doing. I mean, when you're trying to decide between a set of product features, uh, you know, why not focus on the ones that dramatically enhance the experience as opposed to ones that hardly move the needle at all, right? They're just somebody's, well, you know, I'm really good at doing this. So, you know, that's when I'm going to put in the new thing, whatever the new thing is. Um, and, you know, and everything in between. I, 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 you said something that I... I I want to make sure you know the audience um, you know doesn't misunderstand. We we do cover a a huge range of technologies, but it's not a random walk. I mean we uh, we're we're very disciplined in in you know choosing where to work, um, and you know we go through a rather rigorous pro process, uh, typically in the you know in the late summer where. Uh, you know, folks from the labs and, and folks from the business units at Intel, um, you know, meet together to, uh, you know, to 
learn from one another. You know, what's you know what's coming on the competitive side? That's what the product people are you know are so good at. What what's coming you know in terms of technology? What can or you know, we can't do, or what's hot or what's not? And and we literally build priority lists. I mean, you know, top ten or top forty, I guess. It turns out at any instant we have about 50 joint projects between the lab and, and the business unit, again, that cover this huge range. But, you know, they're, they're not chosen because, you know, the lab just said, okay, here's what you get. And they're, and they're not chosen because the, the business unit says, well, you know, this is what I want. I mean, we, you know, we work collaboratively to, you know, to hone that list. Now, we also, um, and I, I tout this as sort of a rule of thumb, um, uh, even though it, it confuses some of my colleagues at Intel. You know, we spend half of every research dollar doing things that are directly related to what the, what the business units are doing, you know, technologies that will enter their product pipelines in the businesses they're in. The other half we spend on, on exploratory uh, work where we don't necessarily have a product um, intercept in mind. Mm. Uh, one of those technologies is silicon photonics. Um, you know, when we started, we couldn't give away that technology, but we had a faith, a belief that it would ultimately uh, yield a, um, you know, an incredibly important uh, advance in, in optical communications, and would, <clears throat> you know, and would ultimately find a home in our in our product. So, uh, you know, I believe quite firmly you have to do you have to do both of those things. Let me ask some questions from the audience now. Sure. As, as usual, we have a lot of terrific questions. Uh, I was going to ask you a question about the relationship between computing and the brain research that Intel is doing, but this is a far more elegant way to ask the <laughs> okay. question than I ever could have come up with. So here it is. On any given day, <coughs> Intel builds many more times the compute devices, transistors, than are in the human brain, neurons. Why is a day's output from Intel less intelligent than a human. <laughs> this is no knock on Intel, by the way. Right, I know. Uh, and how can this be changed? <laughs> yeah, well, um, uh, I guess, I, I, you know, I, I'll just give you my view. I'm, I'm, I don't know if there's an official Intel position, you know, on this. It, it, it you know, it touches on, I think, a number of the themes that, that um, I, I've shared this evening. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, um, we don't understand how the brain works. I'll just say that. Now, there are people with theories of how the brain works, but we don't understand how the brain works. And, um, and you know, I can't tell you how many, you know, neuromorphic architectures I've looked at over the decades. It seems like every 10 years somebody shows up, uh, you know, in my office with a new one. Um, some of them, many of them, too many of them have gone to silicon. Um, but, you know, they're, they're, they're based either on no understanding of the brain or a very rudimentary understanding of the, of the brain. Um, and, and, you know, and that makes me less of a fan of some of these really big projects um, <clears throat> that buy a lot of Intel computers, um, you know, in their, you know, in, in their, um, in their exercise. Um, you know, about, well, if we model every neuron and, you know, every synapse, somehow we're going to figure out how this is actually, you know, coming together. Uh, I think uh, Jeff Hawkins, um, uh, you know, uh, is one of the people who, you know, aggressively tried to find an algorithmic foundation for intelligence. And, you know, and I, and I applaud, you know, that kind of work. I wish, you know, I wish more people were doing that. And, and by analogy, um, you know, um, you know we, we don't build and never did build or never successfully build airplanes that flap their wings. <laughs> A lot of people try doing that. Doesn't work, right? It wasn't until we understood lift and drag and, you know, some of the, the basic, um, you know, um, aerodynamic behaviors that we began to successfully construct aircraft. And I, I don't think we will build, you know, truly intelligence, human class intelligent, uh, you know, systems that, 
you know, that operate on these, you know, on these, um, you know, um, brain-like uh, mechanisms until we understand, uh, in a mathematical sense, what's going on. And I'm all in favor of doing that research. Um, and by the way, that doesn't, you know, doing that research does not preclude all the work that's been going on in machine intelligence. And machine intelligence may eventually converge, you know, with biological intelligence. But uh, you know, for now, I think it, it makes sense for them to pursue independent paths. That's great. Um, it's more complete an answer than I probably would have gotten with my question, so I'm grateful <laughs> for that. Now, here's another one. Uh, the context-based answer you were talking about with computing leads a bit to this, and you talked about it as well with your answer about Stephen Hawking, but th there are all new experiments being tried now with the interface between humans and machines. Uh, what are you seeing now that you think is really a breakthrough or a major step forward in the way that we do deal with that interface with all these machines that surround us and are going to surround us even further? Well, I, I, you know, I think, um, uh, how should I, you know, this, this notion of personal assistance of much more anticipatory uh, kinds of behaviors from you know from our various uh, various devices. I mean, you know, I've I've talked about this uh, at you know at, at the Intel Developer Forum. Genevieve talked about it. Uh, Genevieve Bell talked about it. The recent um, IDF. Um, you know, I mean, um, this fusion of hard sensing and soft sensing. I can't say enough. You know about how critical that is, and how critical the you know the machine intelligence functions are to successfully fusing hard and soft uh, sensing. Uh, you know, your calendar is a wonderful sensor. You know, it knows as well as anyone. Well, maybe short of your administrative assistant, where you are and what you're doing. And you know, and that can be you know that can be harnessed and brought to bear. On you know providing you a set of, of functions and services on your you know on your various devices that suddenly display a surprising degree of understanding of who you are and what you do. Uh, I think that's the potential for for context. When you get in your car, your car should know all of those things, right? Um, you know when you watch television, uh, you know we see bits and pieces of it, you know recommendations and things like that. But there's so much more to it, uh, and I won't even, you know, I won't even tackle unless you throw that question at me. You know, the privacy implications of it all. But um, you know, if we can figure out how to truly secure that information, I think that will be for us as individuals some of the most important information that exists for us on the planet. Someone here has clearly heard about Intel's work, your work, I think, in particular, uh, using science fiction as a visioning platform. So I'm just fascinated with that and how that works. Can you talk a bit about that? Well, um, you know, this is, this is one of Brian David Johnson's major pursuits at, at Intel. He's our, he's our resident futurist, Brian, along with his, uh, with his team. Uh, and, 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 you know, they look... You know, they look for ways to understand the, the impact and opportunities associated with future technologies. You know, if you just, you know, sit somebody down, you know, we're going to sit down, okay, John, you know, we're thinking about this technology, you know, that will transport you, you know, on an instantaneous basis from one physical location on the planet to another. You know, you might, you know, think about that. Well, that would be pretty cool. Yeah, I can imagine that. Um, you know, the social implications of that might not actually have a, you know, play a significant role in that conversation. But if you write a science fiction story that's based on the presence, the premise that such a technology exists or could exist, you get a very different set of insights about how that might change, you know, the way we live and work and play and all of those sorts of things. So, you know, we took that notion... Uh, at first, just to you know, just to the science fiction community, and you know, there are several anthologies of stories now that that take that, uh, that you know, take those those technologies and, and explore them through science, 
through science fiction, but we've, you know, we've drawn other people into it, other futurists uh, and, you know, and other um, scientists, um, social scientists and, you know, and physical scientists. Um, and, and now it's being taught in schools and you know, it, seems to, mm -hmm. it seems to get everybody um, excited in terms of talking about the future in, in a way that's less, should I say, um, uh, you know, speculative crystal ball gazing and actually talking about futures that might really exist. You know, I love uh, uh, Alan Kay's, you know, famous line that he, you know, Alan told me, he said, he only uttered under pressure from some annoying reporter, but, um, you know, the reporter asked, asked Alan, um, uh, you know, well, um, you know, how do you, you know, how do you go about predicting the future? And Alan said, well, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, and I mean, I, li I literally have that engraved on my laptop, right? It says, the best way to predict the future is to invent it, Alan Kay. I've actually shown it to Alan. And, uh, and, and I think that's what really lies at the heart of science fiction prototyping is let's start talking about futures we would like and futures we wouldn't like, and let's go invent the ones that we would like. That's terrific. We are very, very close to being at time, but before we go, uh, and I have a, a, another stack of questions here I would love to answer, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with asking you the question that we, we classically answer every revolutionary who comes to this evening, which is if you were going to give a young person just starting out, a young engineer or someone like the young women we were talking about interested in math or science or engineering today, some advice, and I know you're called upon to do this all the time, what advice would you give them? Um, you have to be fearless. Um, you, know, you have to have, in fact, I just did this at the Grace Hopper Women in Computing Conference. You have to be fearless. You have to have a vision, right? You have to have something, you know, that will change the world if you're, if you're successful. Um, you know, uh, you know, People come to me, you know, from time to time, more often than not, you know, and, and ask for career advice, you know, of some sort. And I'll, I'll simply say, well, what's your agenda? What do you want to do? How do you want to change the world? Tell me that. And then we can have, you know, then we can have a conversation about, about your career. I, I think too many people are sort of willing, um, and it may, be, it may be actually symptomatic of the way our educational system works, People are, are, are much more comfortable being told, well, you know, this year you'll take the 300 level classes and next year you'll take the 400 level classes. I think the real innovators in the world never thought about, you know, gee, could they get into the 400 level class or, you know, did they have to do the 300s before the 400s? That's being fearless and, 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 uh, and, and spending a lot of time thinking about what you want to do and, and make that your agenda and then you know, go forward with the confidence that, you know, with that vision and that focus, you can be successful. Justin Ratner, thank you so much for being here tonight. It's Pleasure. been a great conversation. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.